Waking up Malaysia city volunteers carry out relief work in the recently flooded state of Sabah. We learn about rainwater, the second solo term in the calendar, and what it means for farmers. Welcome to Dar Headlines, I'm Wendy Chen, thank you for joining us. First up in Malaysia, the state of Sabah recently experienced torrential rains, leading to the region's worst flooding in five decades, and over 2,000 local residents were evacuated to six different shelters. To help Kota Kinabalu City volunteers went to the hard-hit area of Beaufort Town to help distribute blankets and daily necessities. In Malaysia, Sabah, Devastating downpours caused the Sangai Padas River to overflow its banks and run into the nearby towns of Beaufort, Penang and Kanigao. For Beaufort town, it faces the worst flooding in five decades. The ground in front of my house and the stairs were submerged. It's impossible to walk to the main road from my house because the water is too high. Now that our water is cut, we don't have water to use. We also don't have enough rice to cook either, so we make porridge to save on expenses. To help, Kotakina Balu City volunteers made a two-hour drive to reach Beaufort, where they carried out a disaster survey and a preliminary aid distribution. Though the floodwaters have receded, most roads are not yet clear. It's not an easy trip to get here. However, we assure you that since we are already here, we'll help you like helping our own family. With Siji's blankets, drinking water and daily necessities, nearly 300 households will be able to get through this difficult time. We are really grateful to the city volunteers. At least now we have the biscuits to warm our stomachs and blankets to keep us warm. The food you gave us will be able to sustain us for at least one week, and we don't have to buy food during that time. Thanks to the city volunteers' emotional and material aid, these flood survivors will soon find a way back on their feet. Of the 130 active volcanoes in Indonesia, two have recently erupted, with the first one in Mount Sinaban in North Sumatra, followed by Kelud in East Java. With over 700 residents sharing two bathrooms at the emergency shelter in Tanjung Pulau, sanitation has become an alarming issue. Thus, city volunteers hired eight local residents to help build new bathrooms, which were completed in mid-February. Let's take a look. On February 17th, Indonesia's president, Susilo Bambang Yudho Yono, visited refugees currently living in East Java's emergency shelters. Seeing the ash-covered area in person, Yudho Yono pays his sincerest respects to those affected and immediately ordered another 400,000 US dollars to be used in rebuilding efforts. Although volcanic activities have decreased, experts warn residents to stay alert in case of heavy rains, causing further damage. The Kalut volcano is still in a dangerous situation. The 10 kilometers radius surrounding the volcano is still under evacuation. For those survivors from Mount Sinabang in North Sumatra, although the government has now declared the area safe, many evacuees continue to remain at shelters. To help the 700 refugees currently sharing the only two bathrooms at the Tanju Pulo shelter, city volunteers started construction on new bathrooms in late January. With the help of eight paid disaster survivors, the four bathrooms were completed in three weeks. Previously, because there were not enough bathrooms, the mornings were often filled with fights. But now city has solved that problem. Thank you so much. City volunteers also distributed comforters and other daily necessities to the disaster survivors, giving them material as well as spiritual support to get through the days ahead. The recent cold front to hit Taiwan has saw an increase in the number of sudden deaths all around the island. Health experts say that the elderly and those who suffer from chronic cardiovascular disease should avoid outdoor activities and make sure they wear enough clothing to keep warm. In the wake of the frigid weather around Taiwan, firefighters and medical personnel have been overwhelmed by calls for emergency help. We found there are more reported cases of carbon monoxide poisoning and an increasing number of emergency calls from seniors and cardiovascular patients. On the night of February 18th, 
One 38-year-old male was rushed to the hospital following a stroke. He suffered from an acute brain stroke. He had not controlled his high blood pressure, and with the extreme weather, his blood vessels contracted and expanded too rapidly, thus bringing on the stroke. If suffering from dizziness, chest distress, and palpitation, one should immediately go to the hospital to prevent a possible stroke, whose side effects include lack of muscle control in the face, speech difficulty, one-sided paralysis, and a change in personality. Especially the elderly, they shouldn't do outdoor exercise early in the morning, as the frigid weather may increase the risk of sudden death. Health experts suggest that to get through the cold winter, members of the public should wear enough clothing to keep warm and not go out unless necessary. It has been more than three months since Typhoon Haiyan devastated central Philippines, and the City Foundation has continued to help residents recover from the calamity with short-term relief work and now long-term rebuilding efforts, including constructing prefabricated classrooms for educational institutes. In Leyte Province, the University of the Philippines Manila School of Health Science was damaged beyond repair. In order to help, City volunteers arrived on February 9th with 11 prefabricated classrooms as well as dormitories. With the help of Chinese entrepreneurs, students, teachers and volunteers, these prefab classrooms were assembled in seven days, helping students return to their studies without much disruption. Looking at the damaged classrooms, it's as if time stood still since Typhoon Haiyan. Without professional workers, these asbestos-filled building materials cannot be cleared away. We could not imagine how we can imagine what the future will be like where when we will be able to return to class again. Located in the middle of the disaster zone, the University of the Philippines Manila School of Health Science is the top school in the country specializing in midwifery. Now that Haiyan had destroyed its campus, residents are worried about a loss of the country's medical talent. Go, go, go! Suji, suji, suji. After the disaster struck, students were transferred to the Tech Club on campus for class. Not long after, city volunteers arrived with prefabricated classrooms to help students resume their education at the Palo campus. Not only professional construction workers, but over 30 university students and teachers volunteered a hand and in turn witnessed the magic of assembling a prefab classroom. Okay, slowly. Once you go in, slowly, yeah. Although we are just students, we still want to do our little bit to help, especially since after the classrooms are completed, we are the beneficiaries of them. Among the volunteers are a group of 20 Chinese businessmen who have set aside their work to concentrate on helping these students. I was inspired when I saw how much Siji has helped Takloban recover. When I saw that Siji needed strong men to help, I recruited my fellow friends to help. In total, 11 prefab classrooms were erected for the UPM School of Health Science in Palo, which will be used for classrooms as well as dormitories. According to the calendar, Yu Shui, which means rainwater, is the second of the 24 solar terms which begin on February 19th this year. The arrival of Yu Shui indicates warmer weather and the gradual increase of rainfall. It is also a time farmers ready their fields in preparation for spring planting. As rain is considered the most important element in the solar terms, this is also a particularly important time of the year for farmers, as only with favorable weather will farmers enjoy a fruitful harvest later on. Here's more. The Lantern Festival marks the end of the Chinese New Year celebrations. It also signals the start of Yu Shui, a time farmers begin to plant their fields in preparation for spring planting. If we begin the sowing or transplanting after ginger, when the weather starts to warm up, much of the harvested panicles will contain unfilled grains 
However, if we sow and transplant the seedling during Li Chun or Yu Shui, then the harvest will be good. Dang Hong Gai Dong, Bian Shuai Gai Shuan Li Zui, Hua Li Wei Wu, Gao Miang Ho Zui. Yu Shui, literally meaning rainwater, is the second solar term. It falls 15 days after the beginning of spring and usually begins on February 19th or 20th. From this time forward, precipitation transforms from snowfall to rainfall. Farming practices rely on rainfall for water, as the coming of rain is important for the farmers to prepare their land. If there is no rain, nothing can be done. Hey! Weather starts to warm up after Li Chun, followed by Yu Shui. After the first spring rain, it will get warmer. These seasonal markers are definite. It's definite. The 24 solar terms were important to the older generation of farmers, who would not have been able to plan agricultural activities without understanding these seasonal markers. Yu Shui normally foretells of an increase in, in wet weather. When seeds are sown, the volume of water needs to be controlled. Spring planting begins 10 days after Li Chun. If we plant or harvest our crops according to the solar terms, we can guarantee a good harvest. If we don't, then we will have to use a lot of pesticides to control pests. Right before or after Yu Shui is a good time for rice farmers to transplant their seedlings. Here in Taiwan's largest agricultural area, the Jiangnan Plain, farmers are busy at work. These seedlings need to be transplanted into a wet paddy field so they don't get exposed to the cold and die. How well crops will grow is directly linked to climate. Farmers depend on rainfall to feed their plots of land in order to produce a good harvest. Without rainfall during Yu Shui, farmers cannot begin their spring planting. It has been said that rainfall during Yu Shui will bring bountiful harvests for the year. However, where the variability and uneven distribution of rainfall can strongly influence crop yields. The western part of Taiwan experienced a much drier climate last winter. Therefore, during the monsoon season, rainfall was more concentrated and heavier. We need just the right amount of rainfall. If we have favorable weather, farmers will have a bumper harvest. But it's all dependent on the weather. As spring is filled with changes, an old saying describes the season like a stepmother's heart, characterized by rapid and unpredictable changes of mood. Taiwan witnessed dramatic changes in weather between Li Chun and Yu Shui this year, blessed with sunshine during the Chinese New Year, with temperatures almost reaching 30 degrees Celsius. In just one week, a cold front swept away the warm spell, bringing the temperature down to just 10 degrees. Just take the weather today, for example, we are already past Li Chun, yet it's even colder than Da Han. Yes, the weather fluctuates drastically. During Yu Shui, the volume of rainfall will increase and be continuous. Whereas it rains very little during winter, it didn't rain so much during the new year. So we are starting to see an increase in rainfall now. As temperatures vary from day to night during Yu Shui, this is also the best season to grow sugarcane. Sugarcane crystallization is most effective when the temperature varies more than 10 degrees. And the best time to harvest sugar canes is between December and March every year. This is the best time for harvest. If you don't harvest the sugar canes during this time, once it ripens, it will bloom and very soon start to wilt. The harvested sugar canes are then put on a small train which takes them to a sugar refinery. Here at Taiwan Sugar Corporation's Wet factory, a sweet scent lingers in the air. After Yu Shui comes Ding Zhe. According to traditional Chinese farming law, during Ding Zhe, thunderstorms will wake up the hibernating insects, indicating a shift to warmer weather and a different kind of springtime scenery. In Taiwan, according to statistics, approximately 5,530 tons of unused clothing is collected from Taipei and New Taipei City each year. However, did you know that a piece of fabric has to go through at least 120 people before it is turned into a t-shirt? In our next report, we learn more about the textile industry and why it is important for us to cherish our resources.
In the world of fashion, many tend to mix and match clothing to stay trendy. However, did you know where your clothes come from? As Taiwan does not grow its own cotton to produce made in Taiwan clothing, textile factories have to purchase raw materials from cotton growing countries. Generally speaking, cotton has four steps spinning, weaving, dyeing, and the actual product. To produce a piece of clothing, cotton has to go through at least 810,000 steps before it becomes an actual piece of clothing. The process is not only time-consuming, but also complicated. At a textile factory, yarns are first rolled into a cylinder shape and next turned into warps. After manufacturing and dyeing, the yarns are finally transformed into fabric. After examination and packaging, these fabric rolls are delivered to different garment factories. These are the front and the back of a polo shirt. These two are the sleeves and this one over here is the collar. This is what it will look like when the manufacturing process is completed. After sewing the parts together, the pieces become a polo shirt. The manufacturing process is not only time-consuming, but also very complicated. Each and every grain of rice is the fruit of toiling farmers. We have to go through just as many steps to make a piece of clothing. Despite the complicated process manufacturers go through to produce clothing, there are still many clothing that have been discarded carelessly. We just took a lot of clothes out of the recycling bins. Some were wrapped in plastic bags, while others had their tags still on. To help organizations for the disabled in Taipei City, the Department of Environmental Protection allows them to set up textile recycling bins around the city. With the help of social welfare organizations, second-hand clothes are given a new lease on life. According to research, every year, approximately 5,530 tons of unused clothing are collected from Taipei and new Taipei cities. Unfortunately, only 10% are in wearable condition. Mountains of discarded clothing piled up points to our wasteful nature. To avoid creating extra waste, perhaps all of us should learn to cherish our resources and rethink our purchasing habits. Do you know that city's recycling stations also collect second-hand clothing? To give second-hand clothing a new lease on life, at city's recycling stations around the island, collected clothing is sorted into two different categories. Clothing that is brand new or in good condition will be delivered to city's second-hand shop, while those in less than ideal condition will be sold to used clothing factories. Let's take a look. To help those in need of clean clothes on a daily basis, volunteers can be seen sorting through unused clothing donated by kind-hearted people at city's recycling stations across the island. Knowing that their unused clothes will be given to those in need, many people make it a point to deliver them to city's recycling stations. Bags of unused clothes are stacked on the second floor, and one can find all sorts of unused clothing here. We have tops, pants, shoes, socks, and even undergarments for men or women. We want to save space, so we will put everything up here. When this space is full, we will call the used clothing factory owners to come pick them up. Bags of second-hand clothing that are in less than ideal condition will be sold to used clothing factories, while those in good condition are delivered to city's second-hand shop. These new items were donated by kind-hearted people. I encourage you to cherish these resources. This one is very pretty. Try this on. This is city's second-hand shop where members of the public can get good deals while giving items in good condition a second lease on life. Brand new clothing given by closed down businesses or clothing that is out of season will be delivered to Tsuji's second hand shop.
The purpose of Tzu Second Hand Shop is to encourage members of the public to cherish resources, while the profit from sales will be donated to the Buddhist NGO to help the less fortunate. New Taipei City, Taipei City, and Jilong City. In these areas, we collect more than 100,000 kilograms of second hand clothing per month. Although it is great to give these items a new lease on life, if members of the public can rethink their shopping habits, perhaps we can greatly reduce the burden on our Mother Earth. Continuing to celebrate the arrival of spring have been city volunteers in Surrey of Canada who held a large-scale ceremony following the establishment of their office in January. And in the United States, city volunteers and teachings in Boston, Massachusetts came together to welcome in the new year as well. Here at a spring festival in Boston, Massachusetts, Tsiching alumni and musicians are putting on a performance to entertain participants. Hong Ruo Xuan, who first joined the Buddhist NGO as a Tsisao, invited her friends to attend the event. I was quite shy at first when they asked me, but I decided to give it a go and it turned out to be quite successful. <laughs> I hope to invite more people to join Tsiji and join our big family. Ling Minghui, a cellist, also arrives in hopes of doing her share to reach those in need. I hope to be someone who lights up the way for others. Having just been through a snowstorm, participants are moved by the warmth and love that surrounds them. The video footage of our relief work and the stories that unfolded made me feel that Tsiji is really a wonderful organization. At the local Tsiji Academy, Tsiji volunteer Ying Shibai shares his relief work experience with students and encourages them to give a little of their love. Tsiji's relief work is still ongoing in the Philippines, and students from the academy hope to lend a hand in their recovery efforts. With love pouring in, participants are starting their year with blessings and good merits. Following the establishment of their office at the end of January, city volunteers in Surrey of Canada are holding a spring festival. In a short video clip, participants look back on city's work worldwide over the past year. In fact, I was quite moved. If I am capable and unable to give in any way, I am willing to give to help the needy. The power of one may be limited, However, by inviting more bodhisattvas to join Tsiji's ranks in spreading love to all corners, the world will be a better place for all. We go back to Indonesia at the end of our show. It has been more than a week following the volcano eruption at Kalut in East Java, and many residents are currently still living in temporary shelters. Knowing the difficult living condition these residents are faced with, city volunteers arrived with relief items and emotional support. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for watching Dire Headlines. Goodbye.